All right, Justin. A, B, C, D, or E. I think I have something for all of these. At oh, least, good. At least I did earlier. I might not anymore. We'll see. Uh-oh. Well, I, I want some news today, so I'm, I want C or D. You got any of those? Uh, I do. Go I on. do. I have a C and a D. The C might be a little weird, but I have a C. And I'll, we'll do a D, too, because the D is like a really quick, short one. Um, okay. So C, uh, just anything, anything random. Um, today I learned that uh, the uh, Southern Baptist Conference, the kind of collection of Southern Baptist churches, um, kind of have like a sex abuse scandal equivalent to the Catholic Church type of situation going on, exposed in 2019. Oh. Yeah, uh, like a, like at least within the last, like maybe Catholicism has it for you know ages longer, but at least from 1900 on, uh, with the Southern Baptist Conference. They've got like at least 700 incidences of sexual child abuse or sexual abuse of a child going for them. Something like that. And they're covering it up too. Like they don't quite do it like the Catholic church where they'll, you know, just ship them off somewhere, but they'll be like, Oh no, that's bad. We're going to fire you from this church just to go get hired by another Southern Baptist church. Like 20 miles down the road type of shit. Wow. Yeah, apparently the big story about it broke in 2019. I I just found out about it today. But yeah. Is that wow? Do you feel better now for choosing the news, Justin? (laughs) Thanks. Thanks for making me feel so much better with that incredible news. I hate you. Hey, I um, I just channel what I know. So, and it's crazy because like I was watching that documentary on Netflix about the Mormon. I, I picked it as yes. a streaming pick. Yeah, I, I know that one sweet. too. Yeah, that that you know that that what keep sweet pray and repeat or whatever it's called. <laughs> I don't think that's it. It's like keep sweet pray and. So there's obey, one other obey. thing I'm missing. Obey. That's it. Keep sweet. Yeah. Pray and obey. That was kind of going on there too. Mm-hmm. With mm-hmm. all these, with the polygamy and the fundamentalist Mormons and all these wives and stuff. And a lot of those wives were under age and 14 and 15 and 16 and being forced into marriages and stuff like that. And man, it's just, kind of becoming something where I'm like, is there any place where this doesn't happen? Like, it's like, and the thing is, you telling me that story, it's like, I'm upset to hear it, but it's sad that I'm not surprised, you know? Um, cause um, the, the thing is the, the, I think the big common thing is though, with all of these types of scandals and all that other stuff, with the Catholic church, with the church of Mormon, with the Southern Baptist conference. I think the big thing isn't necessarily that it happens there because there's millions of people that belong to those organizations. Statistically speaking, it will happen because there's millions of people. So it will happen. Yeah. It's the reaction to it. You know what I mean? Do you go, no, this is bad. We're going to stop it. If you did that, nobody would think, oh, your organization's helping it. Like, but they always go the route of enable. Cover up and enable. That's the problem. It's not that 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 is the problem. Like, and I mean, I don't want to say that it it happening is not the problem. Because yes, of course it is. But I'm just saying, like, statistically speaking, it would be impossible for it not to happen in or an organization of millions of people. Just st- pure statistics would dictate it would happen at least once. You know, it's your reaction to it. You go, no, 
We're going to report you to the cops. We're going to help them investigate. That's bad. You're going to jail. We're going to help out the victims, you know, make sure they get counseling, this, that, everything they need. No, they always just tell the victim, you shut up or it's your fault anyway. Yeah, it's your fault anyway. You need to do something more to prevent that from happening. And I guess that really is just a a culture thing, too. Um, I came across this on Twitter. It's unrelated to kind of the 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 child stuff but to, but to the whole victim blaming and kind of what we do with this kind of culture of enabling like i came across this twitter story and this um woman was talking about how her and a friend were like attacked by these men like they they were at a party or something they were walking home or they were walking to a short distance to somewhere and some men pulled up said hey you know tried to hit on them get in the car whatever they rejected them, and then the men got out and tried to grab them. And they were, like, fighting these guys on the street or whatever. And then there were some bystanders that happened to come by and kind of ran over there and said, hey, what's going on over here? Stop, stop. And then the guys kind of just hurry up, got in the car, and fed off or whatever. So she's talking about this story, and she's saying, you know, um, when women go out, you know, please go in large groups. Sometimes going in a small group isn't even safe, blah, blah. You know, she was just talking about her experience. And there was like an overwhelming number of people that were just like, you should carry a weapon. You should buy a gun. You should learn martial arts. I heard every kind of thing about what a woman should do to like protect themselves. And there were a few responses in there that were like, well, why is it on the woman? Why does the woman have to carry a gun? Why what if, why aren't we talking about what the men need to do? Like stop attacking women, you know? Um, and it's just crazy how like, I didn't hear that enough. I didn't hear enough of like, what, like, what about these dangerous men? What about stopping them? What about stopping that from happening, you know? Yeah, uh, with my ex-wife, she had a stalker. And this was a guy that obviously has mental health issues and whatnot. He has, will stalk and harass dozens of women at the same time. It's not even like he hyper-focuses on one. Dozens, mm. all at once. Like, went to jail for it. All kinds of shit. Restraining orders, all kinds of a news story happened on WGN that featured this man because they were talking about like the state's inability with parole stuff. He was out on parole, cut his ankle monitor off. and was like, I'm going to go break restraining orders. And we called the cops going, look, we know he's coming to Joliet. And the cops were like, well, we can't do anything unless he is on your property because then it's trespassing. I'm like, why isn't it enough to break the law that uh, you cut your ankle monitor off? Like, why is that not enough law breaking to go, hey, let's go arrest this guy? No, we need something else. I'm like, really? That's the time you need, like, something else to back up, like, arresting somebody? They'll they'll think of any other reason to fucking arrest somebody. But, you know, it's this, then they're like, oh, it's like that type of that, like, that's the type of stuff you get. And the reason why I bring that up is because when it first started happening, first started happening, Amy, or she, she was on Facebook and she was talking about like, I've got a stalker, you know, it's really scary, all this other stuff. Same situation, Justin. You need a gun. You need, you know, you need this, you need that, all this other stuff. Not like a, hey, we need better and more appropriate legal and mental health recourse to help these problems. Nope. You need a gun. Yeah, exactly. You need a gun. You need a weapon. You need to carry mace. You need, uh, I mean, you need a Batmobile. Why do they all, why is it always the, you need the victim. You need to do something. Yeah. And that always, I, I just, that also always reminds me too of like school I'm dress sick codes. Of that. School dress codes. 
like if a girl's skirt is more than three inches above her knees, like she needs to get sent home or brought a change of clothes because it's too distracting for the boys. Yeah. Why, why don't you just teach the boys to just do their fucking work? Like, yeah. <laughs> But like, you know, like, but if a, if a guy like breaks the dress code, they don't give a shit because most of the rules are designed for, for young women and girls, you know? Yeah. But it's like, but you, they always, in the same instance, they're, they're sexualizing the young women and then victimizing them for it instead of teaching the young men to not sexualize them. And all this other stuff. It's just, it's, it's, it's the same. It's victim blaming. Like you create yeah. rules to then blame them for it. Exactly. Exactly. And it's just so embedded into the culture. And I'm just so tired of it because you just see that all the time. And I mean, I mean, I, I just saw, I saw hundreds of responses of people going, why don't you have a weapon? And I was just like, why is that the answer? To, uh, but anyway, but but you just but us talking about this, it, it just made me think about that, you know, and all of it sort of lends itself to this enabling, you know, the perpetrators and blaming victims and what more could they do or how was she dressed or, you, you know, it's just, oh, uh, I'm just so sick man and yeah it's such a double standard since you've barely said anything heather how many weapons do you have <laughs> just these two <laughs> okay so none Lethal Correct. Hand. yeah do you have any thoughts on any of this heather I mean, I do think that you're right. Like, it, it feels like a lot of rules like that are put in place for females more so. Um, and even, I mean, being somebody who is, you know, been going to church for a long time, too, even in the church, it's like, oh, ladies, bring a sweater, put a sweater on, like, watch what you're wearing. And it's never really any kind of accountability for the guys to be like, cool, don't sexualize her <laughs> you know or you know, whatever like don't look at her like that or don't be inappropriate about her at church or whatever it is you know it's it's just one of those where even in like a church setting it's always kind of like okay so the female needs to be the one to take responsibility for what's happening here you know um and yeah, it, it's just kind of unfair in a sense, because like, I know I have a lot of friends who they're just like, you know what, they're, they're just very fashionable. They're stylish people. They just want to wear things that they know look good, you know, and it's like, well, why should we have to worry about we want to wear what makes us us, you know, like we want to wear things that we think are part of you know, it just says, oh, this is me. This is something I would wear. This is part of my personality. And you can't even do that because then you get like a slap on the wrist <laughs> for it. But r never in all of my time have I seen somebody be like, hey, guy, you're wearing something wrong. Or, hey, guy, why don't you maybe just don't come over here and talk to her like she's a piece of meat or something like, you know, watch how you're talking to the girls or whatever it is. So, yeah, I agree. I think that it's like this weird double standard of is somehow the girl has to be responsible or be the one to be accountable for that kind of stuff. It's very odd. Yeah, speaking of all that, I think we do need to institute a dress code. Make Justin wear sleeves. Just showing too much skin. Sleeves? <laughs> what are sleeves? You need to wear sweaters, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> you're just you're too distracting Justin. we can't properly podcast with all the flesh you were showing do i even right, have right. any sleeves i might need to buy some stuff by the time september comes around i come to chicago when does it start getting cold around that time what's your definition of cold <laughs> is it cold That's now fair. 
I mean, well, no, like during the days, now. we're like between the 80s and 90s right now. Okay. In the, so y'all, y'all are having a summer. It's a summer. Yeah, but at, at night, it's like 60. Oh, that's the best. That's the I best. I would say probably late September is when it will start to get a little bit on the colder side. But it's, yeah, it's random, dude. I mean, we, I've, I've been out in May and it's in the 40s. Like, also true. There was one year in June when it snowed. So that's a little, it's a little hit or miss. <laughs> As a general rule, maybe get some sleeves though. <laughs> for, so for in other words, yes, I would need some <laughs> sleeves. <laughs> or at least or like Heather sl- said, wear a sweater. Just get a cardigan that you could throw on a, an emergency cardigan. I have several. If you just need to borrow a cardigan while you're here or just bring a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, that makes more yeah, sense. Just bring yeah. a hoodie. I have a couple a of those. And then but I like sweaters. You know, I look around. Oh, right, yeah. See what they got. Just in case. Hey. Um, yeah, we can go ahead and move on, though. I do for I do. Like I said, I have a little small D. Little little bit of movie stuff. Um, so I don't know how much y'all know about this, but what's his name? Aaron Taylor Joy or whatever the fuck his name. No, that's Anna Taylor Joy. Uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson, guy that played Quicksilver in Age of Ultron. That yeah. fucking guy. Um, he's gonna be Craven in the Craven movie, not in a Spider Man movie, in a Craven movie. Um. Hmm. Yeah, it's supposed to come out next year. And I I know this will be a bigger deal to Justin than it will to Heather, but uh cuz I don't know, I just unfortunately I don't know how much you know about Craven the Hunter. Let's just go based on the name first. Let's start with that Craven the Hunter. And apparently in the movie he's going to be an animal lover. Hmm. You know, uh, those hunting animal lovers. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe they'll turn it around and he'll be like a people hunter. Well, so the whole point of him is, is he's hunted in like every big game, every animal, like he's killed them all. And that's why he wants to kill Spider-Man. He's, he's like, that's the last great, you know, quote unquote animal. Cause he's spider. It was like the sixties when he came out. Okay. So, you know, they did that shit. But like, yeah, that's why he yeah. hunts Spider-Man. It's because he's the great hunter and wants the one last challenge. And, you know, he's an animal lover. Why, why are they taking villains and just trying to make them good guys? Like anybody ever uh, asked anybody. for it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I was kind of hoping to get kind of a craven like what they did in the Ultimate Universe where he had the reality show. And so like, and he was this big celebrity and cameras were following around, stuff like that. And so whenever they were spinning that narrative that Spider-Man was this criminal and stuff like that, he sort of stepped up and said, oh, I can catch him, you know. Oh, you know, Craven will dispatch Spider-Man and all this stuff. And then you kind of find out that he's got this whole underground thing he was trying to do. This then the other Spider Man, like, oh, wait, he actually is. A- it was kind of an interesting storyline. I forget what all crooked things he was doing, but they sort of just, you know, modernized him a little bit. He was a hunter, but he was like dog of the bounty hunter, but like out in the African safaris and stuff. And he had a show or whatever. I thought maybe they'd go that route, but I guess not. No, Justin, that sounds too interesting and good to do. <laughs> I guess so. I just love how he's going to be craving the animal lover. Is he still going to have the lion face vest? You know, the vest of a lion's pelt that he killed? The, like, Yes. Exactly. And that's like iconic craving. They better not change him. Watch him just be in orange. He's just going to, he's going to look like the hunter from the 1990s Jumanji movie. Like an old school British yeah. Imperial hunter. Yeah, they're more, re, they're more BSing it up. They're just. That's exactly what it sounds like. So this movie's supposed to come out next year. 
So let's see how much they Morbius it up by uh, if it actually comes out next year or not. Or is it going to get delayed six times? Yeah, that was my that was my little my little movie bit. Yeah, you're just full of bad news today, man. I do what I can. <laughs> I'm not even doing this on a movie I don't like. Typically, that's what I'd save that for. Be like, I hate this movie, so everybody's gonna hit bad shit. I don't even necessarily not like this movie. It's just barely everything else in the world shit. So, you know, just got to have our little rays of sunshine. And if I ruined y'all's days just a little bit, that's my ray of sunshine. I was about to say bad news is very appropriate for you. I could see you drawing happy. Bad news. Yeah. Like the more like slightly upset or disturbed or, you know, unhappy you guys get with the news, the better I feel. I like to leech the happiness away from you. So anyway, something that makes everybody happy, though, is our theme song. Hey, Cine fans, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinema Slayers podcast. I'm Sterling, and as always, I'm joined by Heather and Justin. And today we will talk about what we like, didn't like, and everything in between with the movie Black Phone. We will go uh, spoiler-free recommendations and scores and, and then into a more spoiler-centric section with time codes in the description or in the YouTube to jump around as you so need to. And with all that... We will go spoiler free first for the movie Black Phone with uh Heather. Um I you know what I actually quite enjoyed this movie. I will say that. I think it was interesting. Um it was like a mostly not really a mystery, but I would say a thriller um type of movie. I think it was for the most part, I think it did it did a lot of things right and a lot of things well. Um, I think that the casting was really good. Um, uh, the kid, I think his name is Mason Thames. Um, I think he was phenomenal. I think he did a really great job as the um, the main kid in this movie. And his sister, um, Madeline McGraw, was also great. I think they were both excellent in their roles. I think they had a great chemistry together. I think they were just really great um, counterparts to each other and very, you you get very invested in them specifically in, in this movie um, on purpose. But I just think they, they do a great job of letting you in to that place where you want to be invested in them. Um, They were just so great. I, I just think there were like some subtle things that they did that really made them shine in this movie our good friend, Ethan Hawke or Josh Hartnett, whoever you want to call him. Um, (laughs) I think he was really, really good as this creepy um, grabber is, I believe his name, uh, the grabber. He is so good at this like subtle creepiness that he does with, with the the character that he's playing. And um, it just, it's one of those where it really kind of takes your mind on this journey to where you, your mind in your mind, you're trying to like kind of fill in some blanks as far as, Hmm, what are the things happened prior to this specific storyline? And I think that that's really good um, writing. And if I'm not mistaken, this is based off of a short story by um, Stephen King's son. Um, I can't remember his name, 
but I think it was based on a short story of that, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, making this short story into this movie. Yeah, I, I just feel like there there were definitely some issues as far as um probably mm, I, I would just say probably like the pacing of it was a little bit off um or just not not my preferred pacing, but it it doesn't for me take away from how good the story was and how good the movie was and getting enthralled in the performances and following this kid on his journey through what he's going through with the grabber and all these things. I just feel like you're really invested in the mystery of what's happening. Um, and you're, you're trying to piece it together with him and piece it together with the other people that are investigating. Um, yeah, I just, I really, I thought it was a really great thriller movie. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I think, I mean, it's been a while, I would think, since I've seen a like a thriller movie like that where I was like, yeah, they did a good job with it, you know. So, um, yeah, there were some things off about it, but nothing too crazy that made me say that I did not enjoy this film. You asked him, what about you? Yeah, not bad. Black phone was not bad. Um, I think let's see what 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 are the what have been the past few movies we've seen what men <laughs> um x uh x. yeah uh, uh light year um <laughs> I'm just thinking about the last few like the last two or three like men light year um Jurassic World Dominion yeah Jurassic World <laughs> Dominion so um Man, this is way better than all those. Uh, I, I I had I enjoyed this more than any of those. So, you know, felt like it had been a minute since we had saw something like of this caliber. So it was kind of nice to have something. Now, with that being said, since it was Top better Gun. than those movies. Um, I think the jury's still out with me on whether or not this is great or not. I, I don't think it's great. But but I do think it is good. You know, it's respectable. Everything like that. To me, I, I know I've talked before about sometimes less being more. And like how sometimes movies try to do so many things in them and try to have so many messages and say so much that, that it winds up not really saying much at all and not really much is happening. And I think that this is kind of one of those classics um, movies where it's just very simple. The premise is simple. You know who the bad guy is. You know what he's trying to do. So you understand what's going on here. You understand who your who the characters are. You know the 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 children are very simple. They're they're not complex characters in the way that where you need all these different layers and stuff like that. You, 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 once you get to learn who Finney is, you understand what kind of kid he is. You see him, the, the shy, timid kid, you know, he's got this crush and he's afraid to talk to her. You know, I don't think these are really like spoilery details, but what I'm saying is, is that his character, you get an understanding of his character right away. You get an understanding of who the sister is and everything like that. And as this story is building and everything, what happens is pretty simple. Um, there were a couple of things where I've kind of figured, I, I kind of figured what would happen or you meet a character and you're like, uh, I bet I know what's going to happen to you. And, you know, some of those things did happen. You know, th there weren't any surprises in this, in that way. But everything that is here is just executed very well. It creates the atmosphere that it needs to create. So it has that very spooky kind of tension field sort of atmosphere of this person who is um, going around kidnapping these, these kids. So you, you get a sense of that, you know, you, you, you kind of get a sense of that dread. Um, it's well shot. And by that, I mean, 
we we weren't in a lot of diverse locations. You know, it wasn't like in Jurassic Park where we're in a jungle somewhere. But where but so the loca- the locales, the locations are very few. You know, it, we didn't really go too many places. You know, in this in this movie, we're in a couple of rooms or we're out in a out in the neighborhood and the town looks pretty like about what you would expect the town to look like at that time in the 80s. You know, so it's not, there's not anything like beautiful as far as those details. But I think whenever it needed to create a certain sense of tone, it was edited well enough to capture that for you. Um, Whenever the grabber is doing his thing, they did some things with the cutting and the editing and stuff like that to kind of almost give him maybe supernatural is not the word, but he kind of felt, it felt spooky or almost like a ghost or a specter or something like that. Even though we know that this is a person, they did a good job with the editing and the cutting to kind of give it that feel. Um, So I think that that kept me along for the ride. You know, it was the acting performances. It was the way that it was shot. It's a very simple premise and, the outcome is pretty simple, um, you, you know, and, and it has maybe the the only resolution it really needed to have, you know, once we get to the end of this movie. So I think in its simplicity, that's what makes it good. You know, um, not, they, they don't try to overstay their welcome. I think it's a good length. Um and they don't try to say too much or do too much with this simple plot and premise and it's relatively simple characters. But ultimately, because it doesn't take any chances, it doesn't really um, do anything beyond just presenting you with a, just a well-told story. I do think that that will keep it from being great. Like it, that might keep it from being a great movie, but in all respects, it's a very good film, and I did enjoy watching it. I, for the most part, agree with you guys. Um, I think the the sister stole the show to me, though. Oh, I fucking love yeah, her. I thought she, she was my favorite fucking character, too. Fantastic. I do agree with Heather, though. Like, my biggest issue with this movie is the pacing. It is plotting at best for a big chunk of the movie. And and that works for certain types of movies. But this movie couldn't build tension the same way that some other movies like it could do. Because, and this isn't a spoiler to me, because it's the whole premise of the movie. You know the kid's going to get kidnapped. You know it's coming. That That's the point of the movie, the kid gets kidnapped. So you've got no tension. You, you, you know that's going to happen. It has to happen because that's the whole point of the movie is that the kid gets kidnapped. So it, it doesn't have the ability to create tension. So you can't slow play it. And they slow play the fuck out of the, this movie. This movie to me, and I, I know Justin will understand what I'm saying. Maybe other people will. I don't know if Heather will. A big chunk of this movie to me feels like the beginning of Nightmare Alley. It Mm. just takes so long to really get going. And once it does, it's good. I really enjoyed it. It just takes so long to get there. And, And that's my biggest, biggest problem with this movie is it slow plays it like it's building tension, except there's no tension because you you know what's going to happen. Like the person has to get kidnapped. You know, you you know, the ghosts are going to be there. That's, that's all in the trailer. That's the plot. Like that, that's the synopsis of the movie, you know? So all those things, they don't build tension in the, in, in, and you also don't get any relief. Of the plot with it, or the of the pace with it, because in a normal movie, if you don't know that's what's going to happen, those are like amping up parts. Those are parts that kind of you know, 
like speed it up a little bit because it's it's tension. It's something new. It's it's exciting. There's the what if factor. Like those elements kind of give you the feeling of an increased pace. Because it's the tonal shifts of it all. This movie doesn't have that. This movie doesn't really get that until like the last 15 minutes of the movie. And then it goes. Once it gets going, it feels really good. Like the the move the ending of this movie is super solid. And I think, and like I said, I don't hate it though. I I infinitely enjoyed being a little bit bored, but then ultimately satisfied than just being bored the whole goddamn movie. It wasn't like Jurassic Park where I should be excited constantly. And instead, I'm bored for two and a half hours. It's not like men where I should be, you know, having all these emotions and the ups and downs, the the what's going on, this and that. And instead, I'm bored for the whole fucking movie. I'll take being a little bit bored, but then ultimately go satisfied. Then just being bored for a whole fucking movie. You know, and the thing is, is if those elements weren't the essential synopsis points of the movie, they would have added tension to the movie. They would have given a sense of a a varying pace and stuff like that. They would have added excitement in these, you know, they would have added different emotional and like textural beats to the movie. It's just, unfortunately, those plot points are so integral to the synopsis of the movie that, you know, they're coming. You know, maybe if the trailers had kind of framed it to where the grabber was grabbing kids and the sister was, you know, having her dreams and whatnots and, you know, never giving away the fact that Finney's going to get taken. You know what I mean? Maybe if you hid that part a little bit. Maybe that would have helped. Because then you could have been like, oh, shit. Shit, Finney got took. But no, the trailer's like, hey guys, Finney got took. And you're like, okay. You know, so at that point, you're just waiting for him to get taken because you know that's kind of when the movie really starts. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's when that's when the meat of the movie happens. You know that's the meat of the movie when he gets taken. So essentially, the first like 20, 25 minutes, you're just going. When's it going to get took so we can get to this meat? Tired of eating crackers and bread. Let's get to the meat. You know? So I I can't necessarily blame the movie for that because that could also be just studio trailer bullshit. Because we know almost every director hates trailers for their movies. Because trailers fuck up most movies. But it is what it is. But like I said, ultimately, I came out the movie infinitely more satisfied than a lot of movies we've seen lately with the exception of top gun because top gun i came out just fucking raging just amped beyond belief like one billion is it isn't it now yeah i came out of top gun feeling like i was nicholas cage just got done railing a mountain of cocaine i was amped (laughs) I was the Ready level the of Nick Cage. Zone. I was the level of Nick Cage that I wanted. An unbearable weight of massive talent. I was face off Nick Cage. That's <laughs> what I was. You know. But this movie, I like I said, I came out going, all right. And you know, based on the last couple of years of movies. That's kind of a win. So (laughs) I guess I'll take it. But no, no. But yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Not bad at all. I mean, there's some weird elements to it. Like for this kind of, for this movie, for what it ended up being, 
it was kind of weird that the most violent scenes in the movie were almost had nothing to do with the grabber. Like the opening of the movie is almost more violent than the rest of the movie. It's just like random scenes of like kids with bloody teeth and stuff. It's very, very weird opening of a movie. Very weird. But then like there's a scene. I mean, I guess this is kind of spoilers where the fucking sister beats a kid with a rock. And he's just pouring blood out the side of his head. That motherfucker looked like Ric Flair or Hulk Hogan when they blade. <laughs> just blood everywhere. Good reference. They tried to act like they were a fucking AEW match at this point. I love AEW guys, but fuck, they bleed so damn much on that fucking thing. It's a Wednesday night, and that shit looks like a fucking Rob Zombie horror movie. So much blood. But that that kid's pouring. And then apparently he's just fine. There's no ambulance. There's no cops, no nothing. He's just fine. But, like, those are the most violent scenes in this movie almost until the very end. And it's just kind of weird that it's kind of... It plays on some slasher motifs. Not saying it's a slasher movie, but it plays into slasher motifs a little bit with the grabber character. But it's a weirdly not super violent movie. And not that that's an issue. I'm not trying to say that's a negative. Other than the fact that based on the amount of blood that was pouring out of that kid, the sister killed him. He was dead. He he sat up against that fence and was dying. It, it was nothing. It was just weirdly so much blood. And it was that deep, deep maroon blood. She cracked his skull blood. And the funny and thing just, is, this isn't really a spoiler either, but like didn't right after that, like she sat down right next to him after the fight was over. <laughs> they just like sat oh, next no, no. to each other. <laughs> No, because she got her face kicked. Like her mouth was all bloody. She got her face kicked and she's like, no, I'm tapping out too. So both him and that guy, she (laughs) murdered. Even though he's alive, she murdered him. (laughs) We're just sitting on the fence watching the fight, the rest of the fight. Yeah, they just look at each other like, yep, (laughs) like just chilling. That was a weird scene to me because like it was just it was so much blood. For that kid to still be alive. I legitimately thought, oh no, she murdered him. And then they just went, school the next day, kid's fine. I'm like, damn, how is he alive? Let alone not in the, like, I see you. You just at school the next day. Anyway. That's really all my thoughts about it. I just thought that that was a crazy thing too. Maybe I could have saved that for spoilers. I don't know. I don't think it really affects the movie, though, if you know that that scene happens. Uh, Anyway, uh, recommendations, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Recommendations and score. Uh, Justin, go. Yeah, I can recommend it. Um, It's good enough to recommend. I thought that I had a good time with it. I was entertained throughout. Um, it's just, you know, I, I I just keep coming back to that word simple. I I think it's very, it's an easy to follow story. I think it's pretty straightforward in its storytelling, but where it excels is acting and kind of what it does to atmosphere. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. The acting a sense of atmosphere it was able to create. And then some of those kind of slashery, horror elements that you're talking about are sprinkled in there. Um, maybe there's even a little home alone in this, you know, there's a little, um, there's a little of uh, um, a couple of different things in this. Um, but ultimately it just, it, it, it winds up being compelling enough. I stuck with it. And by the end, like you said, I felt the same way. By the time it got to the end, 
I was like, okay, you know, what happened? I figured that what I figured needed to happen did. And, you know, we got the answers that we needed. It didn't leave too much to the imagination. Um, it didn't really say anything, but what it did say was just to, was enough to finish the movie at a satisfying place. And I think that most people will be cool with that, especially considering, you know, the, the subject matter. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend it. If you're looking for some sort of a like thriller movie or just something that's a little bit different from what's out there now, because this might be like, when I think about the theater lineup I saw in my theater, this is kind of the only movie like this, you know, that's available like at the theater. I, I don't think there's anything really near like in the ballpark of this that's out right now at the movie theater. So, you know, if you're looking for that different flavor, I think this is it. So with that being said, we'll go, um, we'll go 80, um, 80 broken ankles. I ain't talking about no basketball at a hundred. Uh, Heather, what about you? Yeah, I agree. I think, um, it is worth watching. I, I mean, this is sort of my wheelhouse of style of movies that I like the most as far as, you know, it's got a little bit of the thriller suspense, um, mystery side of things and, um, a little bit of a horror element. Like I just, it gave me very similar tone to like prisoners did things like that. So that's for me, that's, that's, my wheelhouse of the type of movies that I like. So in, in that regard, I did like it. I'm not saying it's, you know, the best one of those, but I, I think in general, this type of movie was going to be kind of catered to me a little bit as far as an audience member. But um, I, I did think it was really good. Again, the acting was really good. Sort of what Jason says, like with um, the movie being the slow burn kind of in a way. And I think that probably the pacing issue is why it feels that way, because it is true that, you know, it there it doesn't really have any kind of climactic aspect to it until almost the very end. You know, it really does just kind of it stays at one level almost the whole time, in a sense, until it gets to the, you know, the last part of the movie, the last, you know, 30 minutes of the movie. So. That I will say, obviously, was something I wish was a little bit different. But overall, I just, yeah, I, I think there was there was just something about this movie that was really like I was just intrigued and I was enthralled and mostly with um, obviously Finney, the the boy that was kidnapped, like just kind of seeing his process of like how he's trying to cope with what's happened and how he's trying to survive and how he's trying to escape and seeing the journey of how he's doing those things and these ghosts that are trying to, you know, help him along. I, I think that that's the part that was so interesting to me about it. Uh, just kind of watching, you know, his, his common sense and his smarts and his putting together what he can to try and figure out how he can survive the situation. And it, it was just smart. I think how they did it was smart. I think the, the total outcome of the movie and it, it was, it was not super far fetched, I would say, as far as how how the movie resolved in the end. Um, and I appreciate that. And I just really enjoy the dynamic between Finney and Gwen. I think that they were just such a great brother sister duo. Um, there's something about the way that the actor that plays um, that plays the boy. Um, I just I feel like he made some really cool choices as far as how he, he played this character. Um, he wasn't really a very stereotypical kid in a way. Like, I mean, he was that, he was that, you know, shy, like didn't stick up for himself, whatever, but he wasn't like this, what they would usually classify as like the super nerdy or super geeky or super, you know, whatever kid. Like he was, he genuinely just felt like a normal kid, a normal kid that just got bullied because 
he was kind of a loner a little bit, you know, like it just wasn't, I appreciate that they didn't make him some kind of a stereotypical kid that, you know, was always beat up. I, I think that he was just, he played just a normal kid. And I thought that, that was kind of a benefit to what they did with the rest of the story with him in it. Um, you know, he, he doesn't overly, he's methodical. He doesn't overly freak out. He's not overly emotional considering the situation you think he would be, you know, he just, I, I like the choices he made as far as how he played this character. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, just given sort of, obviously things we'll get into his background and his, his family life, just kind of knowing a little bit of that and sort of where he's coming from but prior to his kidnapping you just sort of see why certain things are not as um he's a little bit more desensitized to some of it in a way um and yeah it was just really interesting to watch it all unfold and see what he did with it but um yeah and again solid ending satisfied by the ending as well and um i i would give it probably the same as you jess and i would give it 80 um axes to the head out of a hundred. Yeah, overall, I think it's a good watch, especially compared to anything else in theaters right now. The only other thing in theaters right now that's really worth watching is Top Gun. So I, I you know, if you really want to go to the movies this fourth of July weekend, and you're not going to go see the new Minions movie because you have kids or whatever. Yeah, go see this. If you're not seeing this, then yeah, go see Top Gun. That is a great 4th of July movie, for I would think. What, Top Gun? Great. Yeah, I think that would be a great thing to see on 4th of July weekend. I'm surprised it didn't come out on 4th of July weekend, honestly. (laughs) True, if they would have waited a little bit. But you know a lot of people are still going to see it anyway. But Yeah. um, yeah. But... I mean, honestly, yeah, outside of Top Gun in most theaters, this is probably your next best movie. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, go watch this. I think the acting's good. I think the story's good. Like I said, my main issue is the the pacing of it. And in, in regards to that, it kind of gives it a more flat tonal spectrum with it. But... Overall, like I said, I came out of it enjoying it. So in the end, that's pretty much the most I can ask of a movie. When it's over, I'm satisfied with watching it. So um, I'll get I'll give it 70 uh, broken ankles. But I am talking about basketball. I don't know why. (laughs) I just felt appropriate out of 100. Uh, spoilers. Yeah. Yeah. Spoilers. My only issue with the very end of this movie is that I know he killed the grabber out of self-defense, but he still murdered a man and was kidnapped and in a very traumatizing position. And instead of having any PTSD or residual effects of it, he's walking around that school with, Big dick energy. Just walking around like, you know, uh, he's, what's his name? Pete Davidson's fucking love life recently. Like He's walking around <laughs> like he fucked Ariana Grande, Kate Beckinsdale, and now he's fucking Kim K. That's how he was walking around in that school afterward. You know, and then he gets up to that girl he's crushing on and she's like, hey, Finny. He's all, it's Finn. I'm like, motherfucker, you should be traumatized to hell right now. (laughs) Right. Nope. Walking around like his balls are touching his feet. Just big dick energy just swinging on everybody. That was a little weird to me. I get that it's technically the 70s and... You know, they didn't acknowledge PTSD or any of that shit back then, but you still could show it. It still existed. You could have just ended it with him in the ambulance with his sister. But no, you just had to go. Nope. 
We got Big Dick Johnson over here. He's got to show it to you now. <laughs> Just a little weird. Yeah, I agree. They could have done without that. They, yeah, they should have ended with him in the ambulance. Actually. At least it's only like 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, it's a quick little thing, but they, they I think they should have just ended with the ambulance. You know, because that was a very nice scene. I really liked that. Yeah. I like the scene that, yeah, the dad comes up and apologizes, whatever. He was kind of a shitty dad. But I liked that scene of him and his sister. Just like connecting again at the end of the movie. I thought that that was, I like it. I, I thought that was so good. It should have just faded to black right then. Because it was a super well shot and well acted scene. Yeah. And I, that's why I wanted to end there and not just go to the weirdest tonal shift in the movie. You're talking about the, like when she basically runs to him, that scene? No, like right after that, like right after he's saved and they're all like doing the police stuff and he's in the ambulance with the little blanket. And she's oh, sitting in the okay. ambulance with the blanket next to him. And the dad comes yeah. up and was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm different now. I'm not an alcoholic that's going to beat you and all this other stuff. And they're just like looking at him like, okay, dad. And he's like, yeah. I love you guys. And they're like, yeah, we love you. But then like, then they're just sitting there. And then they both kind of like put their, that's their head what it on was, each yeah. other. So like, she just faded to black right then. Yeah, you're right. That's just a super solid shot. And to me, that sums up the movie so fucking good. Them in the back of that ambulance comforting each other is like the perfect summation of that movie. Yeah. I thought you meant like when, you know, she's running to him where she figures out, you know, where he is and stuff. And then everything's going down. Like, I was like, that could have been a good place to also end it and fade to black, honestly. But yeah, your part would be better, I think. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think it's a very well shot scene, though. Like, the way they framed them in that ambulance like that, just super good. Yeah. And I just would have loved it if it just ended there. Just because, like I said, to me, it summed up the entirety of the movie right there. Like, it's that perfect culmination of, ultimately, they have each other. Which was a big theme in the movie, so I thought it was super good that, like, doing that. Yeah. You know, but like I said, that's a small gripe because, like I said, at least it's only like a 30 second part of the ending that he's just walking around that fucking school. Like he just got done fucking all of his friends, girlfriends. It was just, his energy was so weird in that scene. It's just a weird juxtaposition. And I get it because they're showing that because of what he went through and all this other stuff, he's not the same kid anymore now. Now he's got confidence. He believes in himself, all those things. But then there's the, you know, the trauma of you were kidnapped, almost murdered, and then you murdered a man. It affects you a little bit. That's all I'm saying. At least a little bit of you would be slightly affected by all those events. Plus your friend dying. Yeah. Lots of things. Yeah. (laughs) And I think that that's kind of a testament to what I was saying earlier about Sometimes you can, a simplicity of a movie can hurt you sometimes, even though it helps, you know, like I think if it was trying to be a more complex story, it probably would have had those elements, you know, but since it was sort of framed, like we want a little kid with no confidence and shy and he's having problems at school, he's got these problems at home. He won't stand up for himself. And so by the end, we just needed to see that he is not that kid anymore. And that seemed to be the only goal. And, you know, I I just think, and because it was simplistic in that way, they did what they wanted to do. You know, the kid got from point A to point B, but like Sterling is saying, but, you know, but in a more complex character, we could have kind of, touched on some of those things but i just don't think the movie was interested in doing any of that it was it was trying to be so simple so i think in a way that 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 makes it easy to follow that makes the ending satisfying but it ain't great because you didn't have that kind of stuff in it 
you know? Yeah. And I agree with what you're saying, but to me, I don't know if the word would be simple. To me personally, I think it's, it's actually just more straightforward. Is that, yeah. That's how I would yeah. word it. I, yeah, I, I 100%. Yeah, straight, yeah. That's a great. Yeah. That's another great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, cause there is some complexity in this movie, but for the most part, it goes, this is point A. You get to the end of the movie, that's point B. Like, it just goes in the straightest of lines. Just. Yeah, that's what it totally was to be. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're in a town. We get to know the characters, right? And we see that this grabber is grabbing people. So the grabber grabs the main character. Then the main character is captured. The, 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 the victims talk to him, which... I think that's probably the most innovative thing about the movie. This idea that these, these ghost victims call him on this phone and talk him through and try to renew his confidence and help him with this issue and this problem. Um, that that's probably the, the most innovative thing about it. I mean, not that there haven't been movies where ghosts, where, you know, ghosts come back and help people or, well, there's a movie called Ghost where he comes back and he helps the wife or whatever. But what I'm saying is that that whole thing about these victims coming back and it's the voices, uh, the, the things that the victims left behind, the voices of these victims help this person overcome being a victim. Th- that's an interesting that's probably the most interesting premise about it, but it plays like a straight line. He hears from everybody, figures out what to do. He does the thing and he defeats the villain. And then the movie is over. It it really is as straightforward as that, you know, even right down to each ghost gives him one part of his plan to escape. There's yep. five ghosts and five parts to his escape. Mm-hmm. You and know. then it just perfectly plays out. You know, the attack happens. One, two, three, four, five. You no know, broke ankle, broken neck. <laughs> Sorry about your look, son. But no, <laughs> but, but to that, if, but so I think it's too straightforward to be like, great. But everything we got was good. You know it's what I'm saying? It's straightforward enough to be good, but not great. Yeah. Complexity. And sometimes that's okay. Why does every movie have great. to be great? You know? Dude. Not I necessarily. Would, like at this point in 2022, I will take a good movie over just should have been great movies constantly. Because I don't think yeah. this movie should have been great. Yeah. yeah. It's perfectly fine with being good. Mm-hmm. And I will 100% accept that. Because there have been too many movies that should have been great. This year alone, I'm not even talking about last year. This year alone, there's too many movies that should have been great and just sucked. Yeah. I mean, two. Dude, fuck last week, Lightyear. Lightyear yeah. should have been great. Sucked. Jurassic World Dominion should have been fan fucking tastic. <laughs> <laughs> boring as shit and that was like an example of a movie just trying to do too much it right. was trying to say this whole big message we got to bring all the characters back we got to we got to have locusts doing all this other stuff we got to have this 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 that and this and at the end we're going to try to say some message about coexisting too much Dude, you know especially like they went they tried to do so much that they went Fuck dinosaurs being the villain of the movie. Yeah, they got lost in the all that it was doing. That it was like, oh man, this is a dinosaur movie, isn't it? You know, so there is an appreciation about this movie just being confident in its straight line. You know, I okay, you draw that line. You know, it's like that kid at school. Like, you know, I want you to, you know, all these other kids are artists and stuff like that, and he's like, man. I draw the best stick figures. You know, I can't draw what he did over there. You know, this kid over here drew Venom. This kid over here can draw Spider-Man, but 
I'm pretty good at these stick figures, man. I'm just, you know, I'm gonna just stick to my sticks. Stay in your lane. <laughs> it also it depends on the genre too. <laughs> yeah. Because this is this is a more thriller type of horror movie. And so complexity really can add to that. You know, it can really deepen some stuff with it, but also kind of like with horror movies, like more of a pure horror movie. Sometimes the simple, the better. Just don't complicate it. Just do some scary shit, you know. But when you add the thriller to it, it does need some complexity to truly be great because that's what helps. Don't get overly complex. Don't get so complex that you're fucking, you know, you get to the end of the movie and you go, I don't know what the fuck just happened. Don't do none kind of that of like shit. It follows, right? Where it's like, it's, it's straightforward as far as like what's happening and what needs to be done to fix the problem. But it's, you know, but it's interesting enough for you to still care. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even something like The Descent from back in the day. Very simple movie. You know, it's a very straightforward movie, but it being more pure horror than something like this, pure horror can work in the simple. You know, simple, just give me some cool death scenes, give me some good scares, give me some good tension. It's all you need. You know, but something like, I don't know, say what's a good dramatic movie? Green Mile. Okay, Green Mile. Green Mile, yeah, you need some complexity. You need some depth. Your depth, not death, depth. You can't just go A to B in a movie like that. Right. You need yeah. some depth. You need that scenery. Yeah, you might be just going A to B, but you need those, you know, Vermont foliage, tree. you know, the trees changing color and, you know, the leaves fall. You need all that depth to it. You need mm-hmm. those beautiful sunset uh, or sunsets. You know what I mean? You need all the the texture and the depth to it. You know, a horror movie can be simple. Same with an action movie. I think more yeah. often than not, action movies are way better when they're simple. I.e., look at the John Wick franchise. Very just true. The most A to B movies out there. But, but there's just <laughs> so much ass kicking from A to B. It's a delight. <laughs> It def- yeah. yeah, it really depends and on the what one you're thing feeling. it does great is the ass kicking. Exactly, you know what I mean. The ass kicking is so innovative and well done and well choreographed that the 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 fighting in that is extraordinary. So even though you've got this straight line, and that's sort of what makes it great. That that's what makes them great action movies. It may have that straight line kind of storytelling, but it has that one thing about it that's extraordinary. And that kind of gets it over the top. This movie, everything that is done, like, I don't want to feel like I'm downing the movie, but everything is done well. Everything is good, but there is nothing done extraordinary. You know what I mean? Whether it's the, um, you know, it wasn't extraordinarily violent. It wasn't extraordinarily scary. It wasn't like there was a little bit of tension, but it wasn't extraordinary. It wasn't like edge of your seat, heart pounding tension. There wasn't anything extraordinary about it. But everything is good. Yeah, I, I, I think that the tension you do get is also towards the end of the movie. The one thing, yeah. the one way I will disagree with you though, Justin, is that I do think Ethan Hawke is extraordinary in this movie. I would say he's the one thing that mm-hmm. is extraordinary. Because okay. the way he would do the different personalities of the grabber. And, I, and also, that's something I will give them. I think the character of the grabber is almost extraordinary. I love what they did with the grabber visually. Mm. With the different masks and the different yeah, combination of masks. Cool. Yeah. 
and then the reason why I say I think Ethan Hawke was extraordinary in this is because he gave each mask combination or version or style, whatever, a different personality. It might not have always been the most completely distinct personalities because some of them would have similarities, but each one was slightly, at least slightly different than the last. And then when he would revisit a mask, he would go back to that personality. So I will say that, that Ethan Hawke brought those textures to that character. Yeah. And in doing so, sometimes with his full face fully covered, it was still a, a, a vibrant and unique character yeah. without any of his face. That's true. By just yeah. using different tonalities in his voice and movements in his body, he was able to make each one of those unique. So I will say that I do think he was extraordinary. But at the, in the same token, though, he's not technically a huge part of the movie. Yeah, I don't think there was enough of him. Maybe that's why I just didn't feel like that. Like, that's fair. I enjoyed the acting performance. I, I did like him in this. I thought he was very good in this. But I don't know, man. I, I didn't walk out going, oh, my gosh, that's one of the best performances I've seen all year. I never had that thought. Maybe it's subtle, if, but it's great. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe... Maybe I needed more on the back end. Maybe if I knew more about the character, maybe if I, I don't know. But I mean, he's just, do I really want to know more about a <laughs> rapist slash child killer? Fair. Do I really, Fair. did I really need that connection? I don't know. So maybe they were, they did the right thing, kind of keeping him at arm's length as far as everything that you knew about him. Maybe that was the right approach. I don't know, but I just didn't, maybe you're right. Maybe it just wasn't enough. Maybe I just needed a little bit more because I did not, I never had that thought like, oh, this is one of the best performances of the year. I ne that never even crossed my mind. Honestly. And I think, honestly, I feel like what would have been a benefit with his character in this movie is just because of how he was and kind of like what Sterling was saying about the different kind of personalities and different aspects of a personality he was bringing out. I think he could have done some kind of crazy like mental manipulation with the kid more than he did. And I think that that might have been something where you, you could have seen a little bit more of just how dangerous and terrifying he is. Um, because I enjoyed the subtlety of how he played this character, the grabber, because I think for who this character was, that's exactly what he needed to be. He needed to be the subtle character under the radar not overtly anything like, I mean, he was an overtly violent person, obviously, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't show that about him and anything you see him doing on screen. Right. And I think that was kind of cool, but I just think, you know, any kind of almost sort of like the, like what they did with him kind of leaving that door open, right. To try and get the kid to leave so that he could play the game with him that was kind of some mental manipulation. And I feel like his words, something that he could have said, a conversation they could have had where he could be doing more of that type of thing with the kid. I think that would have been pretty great to put in here, you know, to just kind of maybe make the kid, you know, almost break his will in some way or something where he would want to give up and not try or think he couldn't get out of there, especially because of his, family life and how he was treated you know i think that that could have been a really cool element to bring into the grabber that would have given you more of maybe what you might have been looking for from him yeah and now you're making me think about things maybe that's what was missing like as you were talking about that because i was thinking about that scene with him leaving the door ajar and him sitting there and he's like huh you know all of that was i mean he was doing a lot of great acting and all of that was intimidating. And it was like, he was a very like intimidating, scary character. But maybe if I knew a little bit more about why that mattered, like obviously it wasn't enough just to kill these kids. There was some part of him 
that needed to yeah. play games and talk to them and manipulate them and things like that. And you never quite understood why, you know, you, you never quite understood that aspect of it. So I'm not saying I needed elements to make him sentimental, but maybe if I understood the methodology more, maybe if I understood what this character was doing, you know, m- maybe that's what was missing. I mean, be, besides just the obvious, okay, maybe he's grooming him. Maybe he's, you know, I've, I've, seen enough crime stuff and watched enough documentaries and all that psychological stuff. I know that sometimes with these killers and stuff, they like to, they, in the fantasy of it, they almost feel like they have a connection to the victim that they really don't have. And there's like this sort of, it's almost like in their head, the victim is a willing participant, even though they aren't, you know, I've seen different analysis and stuff like that he sort of had some of those similar traits, but I guess, I guess I just never really understood. Like, why didn't he just kill this kid and move on to the next? Why was it so important to bring him food and this whole thing about the right time to do this? And let me see if he comes out of the door. Like, Why did he have those ticks? Why wasn't it just enough to kill? Why wasn't it just enjoyable enough to kill? What was it about the rest of that? Well, he obviously had an end game. Like they were talking about, like there was the games, there was the steps to move on to the next part, blah, blah, blah. And they never told you essentially if they had just told you what his end game was, like, does he think he's doing some type of game or, some ritual or whatever to where he thinks he might become the devil or something, or, you know, that he might be free of whatever killed, like tortured him as a kid. What was his end goal with it? They never fully yeah. explained that. They've all, yeah. They, yeah. they have a lot of allusions to it, but they never actually explained definitively ever what it was. Maybe that's what they needed with it. You don't need to sent you know, make him sentimental or any of that aspect. But just definitively say what his end game was, you know, Yeah. because and they did have those scenes of manipulation because he had that scene where he was like, hey, what's your name? And he's like, oh, and then he's like, oh, if you told me your name, I would have let you go. Yeah. You know, like those are great scenes. And, And honestly, Justin, to what you were saying, though, with it, what I was saying that I think he was extraordinary and all this other stuff. It also could be that this movie is so tonally monotonous for a lot of the movie that he was the one dynamic thing during yeah, those true. scenes that maybe that amplifies it for me you know what I mean maybe that like gotcha. you have so much monotony to the movie and he is so dynamic that I'm like that's yeah. the only thing I got that's you know moving that's doing it has energy to it you know he was the thing that got the most imagination I yeah. think you're right about that. When he was grabbing someone, there was a lot going on with the cinematography and the camera work and all of that stuff. Um, all of that was the, how horrifying they made that look with him with those balloons and grabbing somebody and throwing them in. I mean, and on top of um, Ethan Hawke's acting, and like you said, with the different mask and him having to act a certain way because there's a part of his face that's not revealed or is revealed. So it did add these different dynamics with his acting. A lot of imagination and thought and creativity was sort of given to him. And not so much everybody else is pretty simple. You know, the smart aleck sibling, the, 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 the good big brother, um, who gets bullied, um, the cool friend who can fight everybody and the toughest guy in the neighborhood. You know, you kind of have that kid. Uh, you know, all of that stuff is... The star athlete. Yeah, the star athlete. So the, the bullies with no redeeming qualities. Like, you know, all of that stuff is, y- you know, definitely the grabber was the creativity of this. 
So, and you I know, think- as you say that, that just, I can totally understand why you felt that. And I yeah. think, and then too, the, the, where this movie kind of stunts itself a little bit is like, he is easily the most creative thing. It's obviously what they poured the most creative energy into was him. And they didn't tell you his in game. So they didn't even yeah. finalize the creativity of him. Yeah. And I don't know if that was a creative decision. Like we want to keep him kind of mysterious in that way, which can help a character. Sometimes it helps a character to have that mysticism. Maybe that's why I'm just not. Maybe that's why I'm okay. Like, I don't feel like anybody had a problem with this character. Like, I don't think that's a, that's a deal breaker, you know, but maybe that's the thing. Like you're saying, maybe that's the thing that would have just really just, maybe that was the cherry that we needed, man. It's really just, you know, and I think this movie does is a, is a great example of how to do a lot of things right, but have a few things wrong. And it's, it's that ceiling that, that makes you, you know, not be able to achieve greatness, you know? And then like, we, and like, and the thing is, is like I said, I'm not even trying to knock this movie. It's just like, it's those subtle little differences, you know? Yeah. I almost feel bad for saying it because it feels like, um, I don't want it to feel like I don't want somebody listening to think like, man, they're critiquing this harsh. We're really not, <laughs> you know, I, I really liked it. Like I really liked everything, but you know, we're cinema slayers. We got to pick shit apart, you know, but, ma- but, but, but maybe that's why it was so good. You just, it was so close to being great. Maybe that's the way to put it. It was so close to being great, man. It was just like a few yards away, man. You know, he caught that ball at the five and, you know, he just, if he could have just took a few steps, he would have been in the end zone. You man, know? it's the 1999 Super Bowl all over for me. It's the Titans to yeah. stopped at the one yard line. Yeah. At the end of the game. It's, yeah. Man, it, it really is like that. It is that one yard line type of movie. It was just one yard away from being a 90, 95. It just, it's almost, it's that, almost. it's that Des Bryant called no catch in the Packers game in the playoffs. Yeah. You know, it's that it's, and the thing is too, with it, when a movie's truly great, it might have flaws, but you don't notice them as much because it's, it's so great, you know? Yeah. You know? this movie where it does suffer in that regard is the fact that it's, it's not good enough for me to ignore the flaws. Yeah. That's the problem with it. It's just not good enough for me not to. And then on top of that too, when you talk about something like this, you know, and like, like we all said, we're fine with it being just good. But when you saw, when you see that just if the, a few, just a few little things were tweaked, It could have been great. You do want to call attention to those things because it could have been there, but at least it's not a disappointment. At least I'm not like, not in the least, at least I'm not going, man, if they just did a different movie, it would have been great. Exactly. I'm not sitting there saying I'm disappointed. Like, man, I'm so disappointed that this isn't great. That's not really what I'm saying. You know, it it was it was so good that, man, I just I I, I, I sort of walked out like, man, why didn't I like this more? Why am I stuck on 80 percent? You know, that was what was in the back of my mind. Like uh, the, the magic number is 80. Why is that the magic number, Jason? Why can't you go to 90? And I started to kind of dissect it in my head. And then I was then, you know, and sometimes you could convince yourself to go a little higher. I couldn't. I was. 80%. I was just dead set on it. And, and that's okay. You know, it's still no, good, fair. but we got to, but you know, I think we have pointed out enough reasons for why it was just one, it was just one yard away. It was so close. It was so close. So it's worth saying, you know. It's almost like that movie, do you guys remember that movie Searching with John Cho? 
with his missing daughter. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really liked it though. No, I did. I really liked it too. But for me, it, it's almost like that where it was like literally a millisecond off of being like a great movie. It was a really, really good movie. It actually was probably better than this one, but barely, you know, like it was really, really good, but not, not something I'd say that's a great movie, but I would say that's a really good movie, you know? I'm weirdly, cause I think you and me are a little bit flop flipped on those movies. Cause I, yeah, cause you obviously did like this movie more than I did. And mm-hmm. I obviously, I think like searching more than you did. Cause to me, searching is about as low as you can get. And I would still call you great. It's to me, it's the <laughs> lowest edge it's of like, great. Yeah. It's one of those underrated. It, 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 it's it's, it's like, right there. It teeters. It's kind of like that underrated. Great. It's kind of like one of those movies. Like, you know how they always talk about the, the best players to never win a championship or like the, the great, uh, you know, the, 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 the greatest musicians that never got all that, that never got the award or whatever, you know, it's it maybe that's what that is because it was innovative. It, it was it was man that was well paced. That wasn't like this. That was that's true. <laughs> that that's the thing. It definitely has up on this movie is the pacing for sure. <laughs> yeah, like and to and me, the just tension the was there. Creativity of how it was shot. Yeah, and how it. it was shot, and the tension, and the storytelling. That to me is one of those kind of underrated. I'm sad people don't talk about that more. But, but to so me, good. that's one of those underappreciated kind of great movies. So like you said, it's like at the bottom of great. It's not that great where everybody looks up and goes, oh, man, you know, and recognizes it as such. You know, there are movies like that. They're on top of the mountain and they got statues for them and shit. But this is like, you know, it, it doesn't have any of that. But if somebody yeah. brings it up, you're going to you're going to smile. You know what I mean? You're going to be like. Oh yeah, it might it'll get a reaction out of me. If somebody see, brought that up, I'd be like, "Oh, you saw, you know, it'll get that out of me though." But see, that's the other problem with it too. Not too many people saw it. Yeah. And and I'm thinking maybe that's maybe that's really the comparison because it feels like it's a subtly it's so subtly good because nobody's really talking about it. You know, yeah. this one I mm-hmm. feel is also like a really subtly good movie that I mean, I don't know if people are going to talk about it, but it, it just it's one of those that it sneaks up on you with how good it can be in parts, you know, and I guess maybe that's the comparison I mean by it. And that and that's 100% no, you're right. Fair. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that's 100 percent fair. I almost think the difference between these movies is almost like one's a C minus and one's a B plus. Yeah. Yeah. And what really mm. is the difference with that? It's just such a minute difference. I mean, and I know I gave this a 70 like to me, honestly, like searching to me is like an 85. Like to me, that that is a monumental difference, but to me, they're still both in the the, the realm of, you know, they're good movies and all this other stuff. But I th- it, it's it's searching to me is like it's just that under it's an underrated gem of a movie. Because to me, yeah. it's and this is going to sound so weird to everybody because I think these are great movies. It's searching and crawl are just right there together. Because fuck, I love Crawl mm. so much. They're <laughs> just that. right there. And, and nobody saw either one of those movies. I just think they're both utterly fantastic. And I think the difference too, like the reason that you gave this so much lower is because the the pacing for you is such a big problem. That's really, yeah. that's mm. the scale of why you don't like it as much. That's how much of the points matter to you on the pacing. <laughs> Yeah, because honestly, like I said, unfortunately, I have to use the word bored. I was bored for part of this movie. Yeah. But like I said, at least I ended up satisfied. That's why I'm 100% comfortable recommending this movie. Because it's also very hard once I'm bored to get me unbored. Like, once I'm bored... You better fucking really do some shit to get me to go, oh, I'm no longer bored. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And honestly, to me, it was Ethan Hawke's performance and it was the little sister's performance that I think kept me from going completely over the edge of boredom. They were just interesting enough. 
to keep me slightly engaged. Am I the only one who thought that the kid was really good? <laughs> no, he was. To me, he was fine. He was exactly okay. what he needed to be in this movie. I just think every scene he had, though, with his little sister, I kind of feel like she that's stole fair. it, though. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, I really like the sister a lot. Um, and, and no, um, he was good, though. Like, I really liked that there were some scenes that I really thought he really did show his acting chops. The frustration that he showed when none of the plans seemed to be working when he tried to climb out that window and that wasn't happening and he just sort of collapses or whenever he uh, dug the hole in the wall and then the fridge was in the way and he's just sort of kind of like, you know, just kind of in that moment was giving up in the hopelessness of it all. You know, he had some really good scenes. He did. I mean, for me, you know, it was he really, when... Go oh, ahead, I was sorry. just going to say, like Sterling said, exactly what he needed to be. Everything he needed to be for the movie, he was. He was. Yeah. And I think for me, it was it was that. But it was also like when he's actually like face to face with the grabber and he's actually putting into play all of the pieces of the plans that the other boys gave him. And just kind of that whole scene when he actually, you know, he's choking him with the phone cord and. And even after he killed the guy and he just walks out and he's just so numb to what just happened. And like just the way that he played all of that, I was like, for the way that this kid personality wise, who he was and his life in general, that was a perfect reaction that I would have expected from him in that situation. And I appreciated that. I don't know. No, no, that 100 percent valid. And I think, unfortunately, like the movie, though, whenever he got the most actingness out of him was also when the movie was the most Ending. active. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Like his acting performance to me was a lot like the movie, other than the fact that I don't necessarily think the kid was boring. He was just exactly what he needed to be. He was just played the, the exact role in all this other stuff. And then at the end, you know, he did exactly what he was supposed to, but, but, you know, there was way more to him, but there was also, like I said, way more to the movie at the end. You know, everything got amped up. The movie did, his performance did everything. Like I just said, throughout the whole movie, though, the sister had me every time she was on screen, and so did Ethan Hawke. Like, yeah. Both of and them, every time they were on screen, I was paying attention to them. And I think he got overshadowed by that. To also be fair, fair, though, his character was meant to be overshadowed by them. That's true. And and maybe that's what it is. Cause like, I definitely, I agree with both of you that Ethan Hawke and Gwen were completely at that level, like that top notch level. I just also, in my opinion, think the boy is up there with them, but I completely agree because he, he is supposed to be sort of, um, I guess overshadowed is the best word for it because of just the characters that they are. That's just sort of how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. I I like how Sterling said it because initially he wasn't the most interesting character because that's just kind of a character. You know, if you think about the beginning of the movie out of, and, and the first few scenes that you see out of all of those characters, he was the least interesting of the three. You know, him, everything about they were showing you about him, you've kind of seen that character before. You know, he's getting bullied by people at school. He's kind of a loner, but he's got a few friends and he's got this girl that he likes, but he doesn't know how to speak to her. You know, all of that stuff is just kind of stuff you've already seen. So I do think by merit of the story, he wasn't quite as interesting yet. Because he needed to take the journey to become interesting. Whereas the girl was, you know, she's sort of mouthing off and she's teasing him and saying these things to him. And then the whole thing with the father and all of that stuff. And then the dreams. And I mean, she was way more interested than him. I mean, you know what I'm saying? She was a firecracker. She was great. Cool dreams and was getting beat because she was having dreams. And, the you, you know, you felt bad for her. And, you know, the brother's watching this, but 
his biggest problem is, you know, he needs to tell somebody to stand up for himself. Meanwhile, you know, you're seeing the grabber do all this crazy stuff and all these interesting shots and stuff. And then you see her, her story was infinitely more interesting than his at, in the outset. Yeah. So, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. She almost murders somebody way earlier than the movie than he did. <laughs> yeah. And he did murder somebody. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, still and- think she did. <laughs> I think maybe when we saw that bully later in the movie, he was a ghost. Because I don't know how he's alive. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Was, I mean, if anything, yeah. she already was where that character was trying to get. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I actually, I love that. I love that it was the little sister and she was the one that's like, I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I got to do. Like, I love that she was that character and she was protective of her big brother in just a very different way than he was protective of her, but it just was such a good dynamic. And she was, she was just a little firecracker. It was great to watch her. I agree. Yeah. Her prayers were hilarious too. <laughs> and probably super realistic for a girl that age too. Like, <laughs> wasn't she just, wasn't she just like, Jesus, what the fuck? <laughs> Didn't she say yeah. that? Yeah, she did. <laughs> One of my favorite scenes I in the movie. busted out laughing. <laughs> She's like, like, but seriously. <laughs> I know I can't have kids. But if I could and I had a daughter, God, I'd want it to be like her. Yeah. <laughs> she was cool. Yeah, she was cool. But yeah, and I think that that's why. Like, cause I, I don't want to knock his performance because like I said, he did it 100% what the movie asked him to do. It's just unfortunately during certain parts of the movie when it was <laughs> at its what we'd call low points. That meant he kind of was a little bit too. Yeah. No, and that's fair. That is definitely fair. It's just how they were, the characters were written to be. And that's fair. Yeah. And, you know, like, I can connect with her more than I could him. <laughs> and maybe that's it. Maybe I feel like I connected more with him. I don't know. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, if, if, you know, if you're just looking at you and me, I think I'd be considered the firecracker. And I would be the one that probably is a little bit more timid and like needed to stand up for myself. Yeah, that's fair. That is probably exactly why I'm like, that kid was great. <laughs> Does that make Justin the grabber in this scenario? <laughs> ah. Oh, no. Yeah, Justin, I don't know if you're either one of them. Maybe you're a mix of both. Justin's the alcoholic dad. <laughs> oh, man. Do you want to be the grabber or the alcoholic dad? You choose your, your choice. Man, that's that's <laughs> the only choices. Or one of the dead little boys. You get to yeah, choose yeah. between the grabber, the alcoholic dad, or a dead child. <laughs> Man. I guess you could choose the dead cokehead. Do you want to be the dead <laughs> cokehead, Justin? Justin is, uh, like, I'm not going to lie, you're almost like Samson, though, because he was a big, beefy dog. <laughs> you're beefy. He was. He was. There or maybe I could be the brother. He went out pretty cool. Like he figured it out at least. Well, yeah, but he was uh, the cokehead. That's what I was saying. He, do you want to be the cokehead? Oh, yeah, you did say the cokehead. My bad. No, yeah, you could did. be the coke. You could be the cool, like tough like, friend yeah. that helped him out at the end. Yeah, one of the dead kids. Yeah, <laughs> he knew how to fight. You know, he do, knew how to take care. Do you want to be all five of the dead kids combined, Justin? Would that make you feel better? <laughs> With their power combined, <laughs> you're the plan. You're the plan to escape. How did we get here? I'm Finny. Sterling is Gwen. And Jason is just the plan of the movie. <laughs> I like this. I'm though. Five I like people. it. I connect with all of them. With their powers um, combined, you are a captain. Kill the murderer. <laughs> Pretty much. But I will but speaking say. Speaking of the like, dead kids. Oh, go ahead. I was actually just about to say the same thing, honestly. Like, I was just going to say. I, I really like how when they're showing like when the, the boys are first calling him on the phone and they're kind of showing how they got killed or what happened in their scenario where they yeah. got kidnapped. Yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed how they showed that to us. Um, you know, especially with the, I, I don't know. Was it the first kid? The one that was like the kind of like the rock and roll guy, you know, 
Um, he was the first kid to get grabbed, I think. Yeah. No, he wouldn't have been the first kid to get grabbed. He would have been. I actually, I think the athlete technically was the first kid to get grabbed. I think. I think the mm. way they told it was in the order of the way the kids get grabbed. Oh, yes. Yeah, so then he would not have been the first. So he's like the third. He was the f- fourth. Or fourth. He was okay. the one right before yeah. his friend. Right, yeah. right. Well, and yeah. especially the way they did that one, because, you know, you see him on the opposite side of the mattress and he's like, you know, punching stuff and kicking stuff and like what he's saying and how he's pointing. And then you see in Gwen's dreams, too exactly like those motions he's doing she's seeing that in her dreams and how he's telling the story and I, I i just think it was really really cool how they set up explaining what happened to them and explaining just also sort of what gwen is seeing from that side of things it was just very i thought that part was also pretty creative too one thing i will give credit to this movie for is I like the semi not bullshit fake out at the end of the movie because when they get to the house and they bust in and they're like, no one's here. And then they get down to the basement and they're like, Oh no, the dead bodies. I liked that semi fake out because a lesser movie would have had it just be a different house that wasn't tied to the guy. And it would have made all her visions bullshit. It would have made her seeing the ghosts in front of the house bullshit it would have been a bullshit false flag type of scenario. Yeah. And I like the fact that it wasn't the right house for looking for him, but it did have direct ties to him and it had direct ties to the ghosts. You know, I liked that aspect of it because a lesser movie wouldn't have done that. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's a good point. It would have just been a, a, a misdirect tool. And it just would have simply been that regardless of any logic. But yeah, that was cool how he owned two houses and the one across the street is where you're burying people. Like it made a lot of sense, you know, and they, and and that explained it all came back full circle that. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So I will give this movie credit for that, that I I liked that little aspect because when they were doing that and going through the house and they're like, nobody's here. I was like, are we really doing the fake house bullshit? Like, how many times do you see that on a TV show when they're, like, after, like, trying to save the hostage in the first house they go to, and they're like, no, this is the house, and they go, nobody's here, and it's like, oh, man, he must have left an hour ago. Right. You always get that shit, and you're like, ugh. Yeah. (laughs) I thought that that was what was happening. I'm like, you can't be, because it would have been bullshit, because the sister was drawn to that house. She was going to that house, and the ghost appeared in front of her, and she fell off her bike. Like that house had to have ties. So yeah. I'm glad that they did give it a legitimate tie to him. You know, at least there was that payoff. Cause I was yeah. like, that would have been such bullshit if she was led to that house and it just was the wrong one, you know, yeah. or Agreed. some shit. And then you're like, or, or that shit where like they go in and they find the guy dead in the basement, but they can't find Finney. And it's because he's been out for like six hours just roaming the streets, just walking, going, why can't somebody rec- or rescue me? At least they fucking didn't do any of that shit. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll give it credit for that at least. And at least at the end of the movie, there was no like, like weird scare thing or he looks and he sees the grabber standing there. Then he looks again and he's not there and he's like, Oh, damn, I'm still spooked by the grabber. I'm glad they didn't do that either. Because <laughs> I halfway expected that to happen. Or a fake or fake out grabber death. Oh, yeah. yeah. I almost thought bad. they were going to do that when he was walking out of the house. Yeah, because he the was grab- going really slow yes. and it was really quiet. And I was like, man, this dude is going to come from behind him. I, yep. I, I just knew it was. And they didn't do that. You know, they didn't. No, he, kids got Respect. a mint arm. Killed him. Yeah. So it, it did do some things right that like it did, you know, the lesser movies would. And then that's why it's a good movie. Lesser yeah, movies exactly. would have done some bullshit. This at least stayed out of that realm. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So kudos for to, to this movie for doing that shit. Um, you guys got anything else about this movie? Nope. 
I'm good. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Cinema Slayers podcast. Check us out on the internet at www.cinemaslayers.com. Facebook, where we're Cinema Slayers podcast. Twitter and Instagram, where we're Cinema underscore Slayers. TikTok, where we're Cinema Slayers pod. Did I, mean, did I miss any of those? I don't know. I might have. I might not have. Who knows? There's no way of telling at this point. Um, shout out to Plug Migo and Mundo Ochoa for our theme song and logos, respectively. Uh, give us a five-star rating and review. We'd really appreciate it. On YouTube, hit subscribe. Hit the little bell. Hit the like button. All that shit that famous YouTubers say. Do all that shit for us, too. Uh, tell your family. Tell your friends. Tell your friends' family. Tell your family's friends. And most of all, tell those dear sweet mothers because mothers love... Um... Ethan Hawke. You heard it there. Mothers love Josh Hartnett. And, <laughs> you know, most of that all, just too. like in the TikToks and the, <laughs> and the podcast and the YouTube videos. Uh, remember, according to Justin, Moon Knight is the best picture winner. Oh, the father. I forgot to play this. Nobody knows anything that you. scene where he was kind of beating her with the belt All right. was the acting was kind of good to me on that scene. I don't know. I, I I think it was the dad, but it was kind of awkward. I don't know what was awkward about it. I mean, everybody was doing what they were supposed to. Like they were, she was crying and all of that was fine. But I don't know, just some about his acting in that scene. I don't know. I just found well, it. He was supposed weird. to be drunk. Uh, little uh, trivia about that Maybe. scene. Um, that was the one scene that apparently was very hard for them to film because of the subject of it. Not like physically hard to film, but the subject material of that. Uh, the dad beating the daughter scene uh, was very hard to film for people. And apparently that was also the one scene that the studio and test audiences really wanted him to cut. Because really? It, they mm. thought it was just a little too much. And all this mm. other stuff. But he's like, but it really kind of sets up the characterizations of these characters with this stuff. Like that's interesting. It's kind of mm. a you know, kind of critical to show why they are the way they are type of scenes. That's why he didn't cut it. Mm. So interesting. And if there was some difficulty doing it, maybe I felt that. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's something about his acting and maybe I felt that if he had some sort of struggle or like if the subject matter was just kind of difficult. And I know sometimes that happens in the acting. He's trying to be convincing, but at the same time, it's, you know, you're trying to conjure up these emotions and you got this little girl in front of you. Maybe, maybe it felt, maybe I felt something some of that i feel you know. like his i for me i don't think his motive for why he beat her so badly was set up very well um i and maybe that was part mm -hmm. of it like that and obviously be. you know why and he was drunk anyway but you know he's just like but they came to my work <laughs> and your dreams they can't be real and like just the way that they set up like why he was so angry at her was not well executed i think well, I think it was set up nicely at the, towards the end of the movie, though, or later in the movie, when it yeah. was explained that the mom killed herself. Right. Yeah. But then in that felt scene, so bad. you're right. Yeah. In that and scene, it, though, you're just like, what? That's very true, though, because in the scene, you don't know that yet. Yeah. You know, later in the movie, it does cement itself a little better because the mom killed herself, which is implying that that might be why he started drinking. And yeah. it's yeah. honestly, that's just him reacting out of fear that his daughter is going down the same path. Right. Type of scenario. Yeah. So the motive does and make sense, but it's not executed well in the specific scene. I think, Justin. I see. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's maybe maybe much, that was some of it. Yeah. Maybe. Be, maybe I just because I didn't understand the character enough yet. So maybe there I was kind of like. Like, I was like, man, this is, this is a really emotional scene, but there was just something about it that was off to me. I don't know. I don't know. Well, 
And and that makes sense. I just was wondering if y'all had similar feelings. Well, because of that 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 part of the dynamic with the father and the history with the mom and all that other stuff, none of that's explained when that scene happens. You go from just yeah. thinking this guy's a drunk that passes out to all of a sudden he's just beating the shit out of his daughter and screaming at her about her dreams. Right. And you've got no real contextual frame to put it into until yeah. later in the movie. And it's well yeah. later in the movie. It's like 30 to 45 minutes later in the movie that you get those connective parts. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Because the only subtle hints they gave that he might be abusive was just, you know, whenever the noise was being made and he's trying to read that book or the paper or whatever, and then they're like, oh, sorry, we made the noise. And he's sort of, you know, he's tensing up and they're all looking scared like, oh, damn. But he didn't do anything. So I I wasn't sure if it was like just the the parent, like the, I don't, I don't know. I didn't know if that was the, I don't want to get grounded. I'm scared of him. Or I don't want to get beat like a, a damn pig. I'm scared of him. Maybe I just didn't know that yet. <laughs> or maybe you so, just don't want to yeah, get but, yelled at. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you don't want to yeah. get yelled at. Or yeah. maybe you just don't want to get hit. You know, like maybe he might just slap her once or something. You don't expect it to be just a straight up fucking beat down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden yeah. that's the first ever, like first real scene of it is straight beat down. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that now audiences now and people test screening now are like, that's a little too much because man, it used to be the norm to just get <laughs> beat with a belt. Like <laughs> it's crazy how that used to be like a norm. And now, you know, you got audiences going, uh, that's a little too much. I don't want to see that. I mean, I guess that's a good thing, but damn, dude, I re- that used to be common. Boy, that used to be <laughs> commonplace yeah. thing. Yeah. But so, I think I think it's good that it's socially yeah. becoming more. Yeah. You shouldn't savagely beat your children. Exactly. Right. You know, so that's a good thing, you know. Yay, test screen people. <laughs> There's hope after all. So, Heather, do you got anything you want to throw at us that will just make me and Justin go agape and silent for a little while? You want to do that again in this episode? <laughs> you know when what? When are I you think... buying your next gun? <laughs> right? I think that would kind of silence you both, like, in shock. But, uh, no, I think I did enough of that on the last one. I'll give you guys a, a break this time from shock and awe and silence. Well, there it would be go. hilarious if one random day... You were berating her and she just pulls out a Glock and she's like, Sterling, I, I'm sorry. That would that Can might you be the greatest that? thing. You, maybe you do need to get a gun. Maybe they're <laughs> all right. <laughs> we're just sitting there and I'm like, Heather, no, you don't get points in the game. And she's like, but do I now? Yeah, right. It, it would be the game that would make me pull that gun out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, <laughs> um, I need my points. Thanks. Okay, that would be kind of sick. You get a lot of cool points for that. Not for the reasons that the Twitter people were talking about, but that would have just been a great joke. You know, Ah, Um, jokes on you guys. I don't negotiate with terrorists. Oh, man. (laughs) I would double down on the point loss. You know what? He would. You absolutely would do that for sure. That's true. He would. Even like, go ahead and fucking shoot me. Minus five more points for getting blood on me. (laughs) <laughs> you 100% would. would do that. A gun would be in his head and you would still be losing. That's true. Integrity is what that's mm. called. Integrity. Yeah, yeah. Integrity. Got to have it. And the only thing I have integrity about is arbitrary points in a game. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's fair. You have integrity about bagels, though. You be on the bagels. You still be on the bagels, man. Justin, I you don't still be really on them bagels. eat as many bagels as you sound. I went through a bagel phase where I ate four a day. It's fine. 
<laughs> so many just bagels. a phase though I mean, it's I, fine. I still can't believe it, it. here we phase. are years later and i still i'm 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 just so upset i just look at you differently <laughs> after you told that story what about what about the fact justin <laughs> that i ate 21 bagel bites last night oh my gosh you've evolved <laughs> but they weren't full on bagels justin they were bagel bites <laughs> It's with the pizzas on a bagel, you can eat pizza anytime. <laughs> pizza. Oh no, I feel like Jason's like physically hurt by this information. <laughs> it did hurt. It did hurt. I'm in pain. Good. That only fuels me and makes me stronger. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, all right. What when you come up here, you're just gonna have to sit down and eat four bagels and give it a try. Vacation Justin is different, you know. You just gotta try it. Don't knock it till you try it. Just saying. Man, I know what carbs, man. <laughs> don't knock carbs. Man, four, carbs are wonderful, okay? Four bagels. But I don't know about four. You. I don't know about four. I mean, these weren't like <laughs> New York bagels. They weren't big. They were just uh, bagel bagels. Oh, bagel bagels. And you just and you just eat them. You don't no butter, nothing. Just no, right, baby. no, you toast them and you put some cream cheese on them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Somehow that had, makes it better for you. I had the schmear. Eating the bagel. <laughs> it, would, it would typically be two plain bagels, one cinnamon raisin, and one everything Ooh, basil, bagel. See, it wasn't just like, it was just, it was, it was, there was a ratio. And all of them had the schmear of cream cheese. Is there like a, are, are those pretty much like the go-tos? Or like, is there like a list of like great tasting ways to prepare to dress up bagels before you eat? I wonder if there's like a list of like, like, or recipe where you can find like, if you put these things on it and then eat it, it's great or something like that. I mean, a standard bagel, it's just a bagel cream cheese. That's good. You know, I do like an everything bagel where you get your sesame seeds and your your onion powder and your, your garlic powder. Well, it's like onion chips and garlic chips in it. I think those are, that's a delightful flavor profile with it. Um, but then there's just something about that cinnamon raisin though. Get that cinnamon raisin bagels to put that <laughs> smear of cream that's cheese good. on it. Oh man. That's I like those nice. and the blueberry bagels. I like too. Blueberries are fine bagels, but if I'm eating blueberries, I prefer blueberry donuts. Same. I like, I like a good old fashioned blueberry cake donut. Ooh, yep, that's my good. favorite. Yep. Do you guys have any like? Are there any donut specialty places like Justin. Justin, there where Justin. they do all kinds of stuff to donuts? I went to. Um, I where live. Was I? I live two blocks away from like the premier donut place in Illinois. Oh, it's been on okay. national television. What? Okay, so home cut Wait, donuts. We may, have to go. oh. we may have to go there home. because I went to a place. I want to say I was in Oklahoma, and like, um, a friend took me to the shop, and like, they had there was a Smurf donut where it was blue and it had like little like characters on it. Like they had all kinds of donuts. See, this um, place has all kinds of donuts, but they are all they're all homemade. You know, they're all homemade donuts. But like one of their more famous ones is the angel cream. Essentially, it's kind of a like a special whipped cream they make injected into a donut. Mm. Yeah. Um, their Bavarian creams are really good. I love their French crullers. Their French crullers are one of the best I've ever had. What? Yeah. I love their French crullers. They're just beyond belief. But it is just an old school, twenty four seven. We make our own donuts. Donut shop. Wow! I see. I'm more of a donut guy, a bagel guy. Yeah, I guess I you can like them both. But when you come here, I just you know donuts is yeah, we, that. Dope. When you come here, well, we 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 walk. I we can just walk right over. It's, like I said, it's truly not that far away. And that's oh, when I go, that's when nice. I go get it. I just walk over. Oh, that's nice. Walk over, get us a nice assorted does. 
I'm jealous. Mm. It sounds good. Yeah, that'd be nice. Wake up, make some coffee, you know, head on over there. Or do they have coffee? I don't know. What would be the best way to do that? Yeah, dude, they're a 24-7 donut shop. They have coffee. Okay. Over there, have a coffee. Sound good to you, Heather? Bring the 100%. Glock. Really cool. <laughs> Always Before. bring it when I, take, I mean, you know, when I get my coffee, of case, course. Worst case scenario, we can just go get a does and we can drive to Heather. And we can eat some home cut donuts and drink some coffee. That'd be tight. Record a coffee and donuts. Talk, talk about whatever. Yes. Just Glock. Yeah, this famous. I mean, I know a lot about him, so. And right. <laughs> Real gentle talking it. about Glocks. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Super good donuts, Justin. This, this okay. donut talk, like, I'm excited that you're coming to visit, Justin, but like, this whole thing is probably the thing I'm most looking forward to so far for you being here. <laughs> home cut donuts with you guys and uh you know just chilling with coffee well that's on the itinerary that is happening for oh. sure yes <laughs> donuts <laughs> where did we go where they dressed up where we dressed up and they had really good food they had the steak and the then the sides morton's, morton's. Very good. I think I think this time if we go, we should go to the Ruth's Chris. It's in the city. Oh, so. oh, is oh, is it some place else? Okay, yeah, yeah let's I'm go down. To Ruth's Chris. Okay. And maybe is we it should... another steak place, or is this like yeah, yeah, steakhouse? Specialty? Ruth's Chris oh, okay. is, a, is a steakhouse. Okay, yeah, super super top end steakhouse. Um, one other thing we need to do, Justin, while you're here is we should probably go to Chevelle in the city. Um, because Chevelle, it's supposed to have the best burger in Chicago. Like, it's it's a $20 gourmet hamburger. Like, it's not, like, just, like, a regular hamburger. And, like, most people, whenever you're talking about, like, burgers in Chicago, yeah, there are better, like, a lot of people consider maybe the greasier, like, more diner style are better. But, like, Chevelle, when it comes to, like, the fancy hamburgers, like a $20 hamburger. It's supposed to be like, well, yeah, it's fucking delicious though. Might be 20 bucks, okay. but it's delicious type of scenario. Nice. Okay. We'll do you that. You guys too. know we're still recording, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everybody. The last thing I'll say. Chris. <laughs> Cause I'm probably going, I'm, I'm thinking about taking a week. I'm, I'm well, I wanted to confirm with y'all what works. But shoot. I was thinking about, man, Oh, this is a week. It'll be a holiday and I can take off the days. I'm already it, off that week. I can make arrangements. Yeah, we'll you work know, it out. Know. I'm fine with that. You know, See, wrestle, so you're like, because I'll wrestle that, that Friday, but then I was thinking, man, I could just wrestle Friday and then just stay the next Friday or something like See, that. So we're going to have several special podcasts. We're going to record whatever, some re- podcast like a normal one that week. We'll record a coffee and donuts episode. And one thing I think we should do is I actually have a version of a m- Monopoly called the world's longest game of Monopoly. Uh-oh. Okay. And we can record an episode at least of a little while of us playing. That'd be funny. But it's okay. It's, it's like this is like this version of Monopoly only comes with one die. Because two die would mean you could go 12 spots oh. and then roll again because that means double sixes. No, there's no doubles. You can't roll doubles to get out of jail because there's only one die. Yeah. World's longest version. Yeah, that's crazy. I also have a okay. D&D version of Clue. <laughs> what? Nice. Yeah. Got to try that too. Where they've got special powers, like each each character has a different ability that you can use too. See, I've got all the fun stuff. We can. We're just gonna have a week of 
special podcast episodes. <laughs> yes. That'd be. But on that note, I'm out. <laughs>